session. Hi, good afternoon. So, uh, so I would like to invite all of you to uh, stay back for the instruction course on the A to Z of presbyopia surgery for general ophthalmologist. Uh, we all know that presbyopia is currently the holy grail in refractive surgery. Uh, it is the commonest refractive error that we have in the world today. And there is an exponential increase in demand for presbyopia reversal today. Even for general ophthalmologists, a lot of people do come to them and they ask that I don't want my near glasses, I don't like them. Is there anything that you can do for me? And also there are variety. Have you got a laptop? Yeah, I have. So that. we have to open it to, to put this no problem. I don't have the adapter. For it's an adapter. IPad. But you can put it in this. They side. are not accepting. No? Uh, Anand, are you using your laptop? There only. You have Apple? No, that's also fine. So basically, now you have a variety of approaches which are possible today, uh, which are corneal approaches, lens-based approaches, scleral approaches, combination of them. And what we are going to take you through with uh, some of the most experienced uh, co-instructors, uh, Dr. Shashi Kapoor, Dr. Anand Parsarthi, uh, Dr. Praveen Krishna, Dr. Gaurav Luthra, and we have a keynote by uh, none other than Professor Klaes uh, Feinbaum. So uh, basically, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Anand, uh, and Dr. Shashi Kapoor, do please come on the dais. I would like to also in invite uh, Professor Klaus uh, Feinbaum to please, sir, come on the dais and take your seat. So what we have to understand is that every single case has to be customized when we are looking at presbyopia reversal. And we are going to discuss uh, different varieties of approaches and when we are choosing what kind of approach so that you can have a nice overview of all the different procedures and then you have an idea about which kind of approach should suit your patient. Uh, all these approaches are very simple. Uh, most of them are available commonplace, so you can actually apply them. You can start doing the procedures on your patients also with the help of this knowledge. Yes. So I think to begin the session, uh, I would like to ask you, how many of you are currently uh, practicing refractive surgery? Can I have a show of hands? Okay, so maybe 8 to 10 of you. Other people are not yet into the refractive surgery, but nevertheless, as we have discussed, this is a common problem. So uh, even if your patient comes to you for asking you whether there is any sense of undergoing presbyopic LASIK or monovision or lens exchange uh, with the multifocal lenses or corneal inlays, you should be able to guide them well. In the, uh, in the, with the knowledge that you will gain through this. So to begin with, you have to actually understand how to evaluate your presbyopic patients very well. Yes, so uh, before that, we are going to uh, have the keynote address by uh, Professor Kleis Feinbaum, and he is going to discuss with us about ISOVision, which is a new software for presbyopic laser refractive procedure, AV, yes, thank you. Uh, over to you, Professor Klaus Feinbaum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for having me back here in India. I enjoy it fully. And uh, I think this is my 10th or 11th time I'm here. Still have difficulty getting used to the food, but uh, I survive. Now, in this lecture, I do have a financial interest since I partly on the patents of Isovision. So, but I tried to be objective, and you've heard me before, so you know. We're trying to enter a new era. Like Presbylasic. And we also know now that on the several fake guys, we can do presbylasic quite favorably. The presbylasic database, if you go back, you remember you had monovision, you had advanced monovision from Theo Seiler, and you had the blended vision from Dan Reinstein, and now you have Isovision from Frederiken and Undersigned. 
And you can see that they are built on different or a combination of refractive and a Q factor. So the insufficient benefits is that no myopia, no compromise 66 Jagger 2, monocular possible, and we're trying to preserve the natural binocular vision to all vision distances and no decrease of contrast sensitivity. And the insufficient disadvantages is that the software is off label and Alcon did not like it. So, but we done all of the work with the wave light and it's working very nicely. I should also tell you that the basis of all what we have done, Frederick and myself, goes back 14 years. 14. That was when I had Presbylasic done to myself, and it still works. So the database is that we have a Q factor for distance of 2, or minus of 0.2. In this case, this is emetropia, and you already have a central shape for the distance vision. So we do an FCAT for intermediate and near, and then you create a Q factor of minus one with the FCAT treatment. Here's, we use eye trace quite successfully, and you can see the refractive maps and the MTF pre-op and post-op on the slide here. And you can see, if you look down on the right-hand side, the shape of the cornea again, and that is exactly the shape we used 14 years ago to do a presbyopic profile. So with a prolate cornea, the vision is revitalized. You can see the difference between a young and an old cornea, and you can also see the differences in the topographies. The depth of focus, you heard me earlier today talk about the importance of depth of focus or depth of vision. I think, in my humble experience, that this is the way to go. The benefits of ease of vision in this case is that it gives better than any microvision that you can create. There will be no gap in intermediate vision will be a continuous depth of focus, and you have a wide field stenopoeic hole, and good vision, good quality of vision, from 30 centimeters to infinity. The disadvantages is that it's less powerful than myopia for near vision. Examples. Here you see the pre-op and post-op maps of one patient, and you can see, clearly see how we have changed the shape of the corneas here. Another case, pre-op and post-op, and look at the profiles, the lower profiles, exactly as the original profile we used 14 years ago. MTF functions, pre-op and post-op, also very clear and very stable. A myop, or minus six, pre and post, you see the central sloping, and here you have the shapes. And the MTF functions, pre and post-op. So, Ease of vision is a quite a simple method. It's a two-step method. And we do not take into our 
I account I dominance. So there is a very little risk factor. We've done the exhibition now all over the world, except of course the USA. I do not intend to go through the hassle of FDA. It takes too much power. So 2,000 eyes have been treated in 50 different ophthalmic surgeons, and we have no support for any laboratory or any international study at this present time. It's safe with the advantages of a safety key. FCAT Cernic 4 has been close to 0 0.01 micrometers RMS. The disadvantages, it's only available for the allegretum. And it's adapted for the patient. You can play around. If you want dominant dive for far, if you wish to have monovision, you can upgrade this eye later on if you like to the same profile as the left eye. You can use it in PRK, and it's possible in the pseudofake. Of course, the disadvantage is that already operated patients, well, there we have to lift the, the flap to upgrade, and it's not yet available for smi the SMILE procedure. The advantages of marketing, patients do not want to have monovision. I want the two eyes to be the same. You hear it over and over again in the clinic. And the disadvantages of this is that in some cases there have been reports of slow recovery of the distance vision emetropic eye. It goes a little bit slower. Results, very stable, three months follow up, as you can see, both distance and near vision are good and stable. Monocular high probes, the same after three months follow-up. And the emetropes, as I said, a little bit slower. We're losing out a little bit for the near fraction. But we still lose a little bit. We have binocular three-month follow-up. For the myopes, you can see they're fairly stable. For the hyperopes, even an increase for near. And for the emetropes, after a while, you see that you recover and you have an increase. So good near vision for all, good distance vision for all, and very low rates of redoing. And I am a little bit skeptical to do is a vision bilaterally if you have emetropic patients. I am hesitant to do that. We have some patients now over a five year period and they are extremely stable. You see the profile is there. And for cataracts, it's an easy treatment. You take the central K on the oculizer for the IOL calculation. So that concludes my paper. I, if you want to know more, I will be available afterwards for you to have more information where you can get a hold of the program. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Hello. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think that was very innovative and very enlightening. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, kind uh, description of this new technique. Uh, so I would like to now uh, get to the basics, which is uh, presbyopia, how to do the patient evaluation by none other than Dr. Shashi Kapoor. As we all know, he's uh, one of the pioneering surgeons of India, was the first person in India to get actually the eczema laser in 1992 or three. So he has a vast experience. So he's also a professor at JJ Hospitals. So he's going to take us through 
the patient evaluation for presbyopia patients. Thank you. Thank you, Vardhaman, for the opportunity today and uh, friends. Uh, accommodation is something at the age of 12, we have about 14 diapters. By the age of 35, it is halved. And by 45, it is clinical press biopia. The amount of loss of accommodation documented by so many studies has remained constant, that by the age of 35, 45, there's hardly any accommodation left. The uh, amplitude of accommodation, so, yeah, sorry, this is, the regression formula which can really measure the accommodation also finds correlation with most of the studies and this formula 18.5 minus you find the results you get with it are almost the same uh, how do we measure accommodation let's why i'm getting into all these basics is that uh, i see today of dr vardhaman gankarya is press biopic lasik and curing press biopia. So without knowing what is accommodation, how much it is, can we measure it, how much do you get on measurements, we won't, shouldn't be able to go to the next step. So first thing, it is easily measured, you just put the correct refraction, if it's a very old person, add a little bit of lens so he can see the near chart, you can deduct that amount later on from your final result that you get, and whatever you get, the reciprocal of that in meters is your near point. So you can bring it, there's a push-in method, you bring a chart till it blurs close to the uh, patient's eye and the reciprocal of that gives you the accommodation amplitude. You can take the card backward from a blurred position and uh, you can add negative lenses till the blurring occurs. So there are various ways of measuring this but all of them will give you the amount of accommodation now as soon as you talk about a press biopic patient you'll hear this word monovision ocular dominance as soon as you say monovision they'll say make the dominant eye far make the non-dominant eye near etc etc so what is dominance so dominance should mean superiority of one eye over the other now does it really if you get into it, there are 22 types of dominance, sensory dominance, directional dominance, oculomotor dominance, dominance for each one of them is different for distant, for near, the way you measure it, and you'll be surprised, none of the tests match. Any person you say he was right eye dominant, by this test, you have not even told, did you test it on a distant vision or a near vision? Did you test it with one eye or both eyes open? Did you test it? So the entire concept of dominance, if you'll see now, sensory, oculomotor, directional, nothing correlates to anything. And the degree of dominance also changes. Even if you say he's dominant in right eye, some people are strongly dominant, some alternate very easily, some, you know, have an equal preference. So even besides the whole gamut of dominance, the degree of dominance could be so different. The commonest dominance is sighting test. You tell the patient to look at a far object, take a hole in a card, or he can even put his hands together, look through it, occlude each eye, and whichever eye is supposed to be dominance for distance by a sighting test for directional dominance. It's very, very specific. So sensory dominance is more, you know, binocular uh, rivalry and all that. And you can, various methods of doing it, which are not so clinically oriented, but there's been various discussion whether the role of sensory is important, not important. So you could get traditionally like a right eye dominant for distance and left eye, and it's okay. What if you get both eyes dominant for distance, both for near? It's quite possible. Once you use so many tests, and you do it, and these patients could have difficulty adapting. This is one scientific paper where they did a large number of cases, nine different tests in each patient, 51 emetropes, and nothing was matching. The, there was no correlation of equivalence. There was nothing statistically to show that any dominance had a preference over another test, or a person should be classified as dominant in a particular eye. And therefore, it was concluded 
that monovision, that is why it's tolerated in most patients, because most patients are not dominant in any eye. And in fact, if you want to test, you should test so that if you find out he's very strongly dominant only in one eye, he is not suitable for monovision. You know, that's a more uh, better way of looking at this. The last thing that I would like to say is angle kappa comes up very often. And as we know, angle kappa also depends what machine measure it. You measure a synopter 4, normal value is 2.8. You measure on a op scan, normal value is 5.5. You measure on the new op scan, it is 4.9. You measure it, you know, the corneal light reflects it's something else and very approximate. So, uh, mind you, this is op scan printout. It gives you in the last line the kappa and the kappa intercept. So this is normal, as we know, positive angle kappa, nasal word, displacement of the corneal light reflex, about 5 degrees, and uh, there's about 0.500 microns, or 10 prism diopters. So this comes up in both LASIK as well as multifocal, if you are going to correct press biopia with multifocal IOLs. So how does it do it? We'll see now that in multifocals, they'll say that if the angle kappa is more than half the diameter of the central optical zone, then don't insert that multifocal IOL. So for a restore and techness, is about 400 to 500 microns, which is, okay, also the normal limit of angle kappa. Now this, some people said, so we will decenter our multifocal IOL at the end of the surgery, which obviously doesn't make a lot of sense because IOLs auto-center in the capsular bag, there's contraction of the capsule, there's memory of the haptics, IOL rotation, and so many features, so such loose talk that I center it, decenter it, you know, at the end of surgery, I think should be uh, given only that much importance. And dissatisfaction with multifocal IOL may not be only related to cap uh, angle kappa. You know, there's a host of reasons why multifocal IOL patients might be unhappy. LASIK surgery is usually centered either on the pupil for the reason that pupil is most of the photoreceptors are oriented to the pupil. The pupillary light bundle rays are the ones which finally form the image. Coaxially sighted corneal light reflex. This is one of the ways where you're trying to put it on the visual axis. And then came that you should put it between these two, between the visual axis and the center of the pupil. Or some people even said corneal vertex, which is the uh, highest point on topography. So in there's very few proper studies. The only problem is uh, issue comes in hyperopes. For example, this study is there in hyperopes where half were put in pupil center and half decentering and they found no statistical difference in terms of safety, efficacy or accuracy between the two methods of centering. Mind you, they themselves say that our drawback is we only did mild to moderate hyperopes. I myself would not do a large hyperop with LASIK anyway. You wouldn't do a plus eight or a plus nine. So anyway, I think in that way, their study seems to be fairly substantial. Pupil itself is a dynamic part of the refractive error problems. As you can see, only changing the size of the pupil with a refractive error causes so much of blurring. So do, we have to remember, we must know at what size pupil we discuss any matter. And even without accommodation, people have depth of focus, okay? And that depth of focus is what accounts for so many anecdotal things. Someone will say, my patient can read even with a monofocal eye oil. Someone will say, this multifocal, but besides accommodation, besides everything, there is depth of focus. Cornea inlays, cameras and all probably create a depth of focus. Aspheric pre press biopic uh, ablation profiles are there. Depth of focus depends on many factors in itself including target factors, pupil diameters, diffraction, and other aberrations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so I think uh, before we go on to the next talk, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kapoor, sir, depending on the analysis of the patients that you have done, is there a approach that you pre-select depending on how is the patient's uh, dominance, refractive error, and everything else, age, et cetera, et cetera. So is there any thing that you can tell to the uh, delegates So, here? So uh, I, I know you must be having, and everyone has their own, uh, you know, technique. So if you're asking me, I would, if I get a 45-year-old, even myop, in a good moderate myopia, four to five diopters, I would correct it even with LASIK, you know, do clear minus five in one eye, minus three in the other eye, 
and I find the patients are fairly satisfied. If the patient is beyond 50, 55, you know, it's a good chance. Many of them can, you can find posterior subcapsular cataract. And I think removing that with a multifocal mix uh, would, would be my choice. And, uh, you know, it sort of appeals to me. And uh, these are the two hypermetropes I'm very happy to do. They are really happy, whether they are 40 years old, 45, 50, you correct them and overcorrect them in the other eye with LASIK. And they are really, really happy, you know. Uh, I, I used to be afraid of the regression in hypermetropes, but I'm surprised that after the age of 40, 50, I think the biomechanics of the cornea is stabilized maybe or something, but they don't behave like those 20-year-old hypermetropes. And they are not regressing, which I think is a very good point. In that case, you can really satisfy them. So what will you do, like I would like to ask this to all the panel, actually, if a 38-year-old, uh, a 38-year-old software professional has come to you, I think this is a very common thing that we see in our practice, and you have seen that he has a very good pachymetry, has about minus four diapters on both the eyes, he's about 38-year-old, what would you do for him? Would you correct him for distance or would you actually uh, plan him to do a micro mono vision? What will you do? I think we'll start with... I'll offer panel. it to the most senior panelists and then I'll tell All you right, what sure. I So think. I think we'll start with uh, Professor. 38 year old. In dominant eye, full correction. And I leave about one, one and a half day up to my OP in the other eye and the patient will be extremely happy. Uh, so I think that would be my choice also. A uh, complete correction in one eye. I won't try to find out which is this because uh, from what I understood of dominance. But, uh, 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 but uh, uh, the other eye, uh, I, I would uh, leave about one, one and a half diapters definitely. But how much? Like one or one and a half? Because this is the decision that we have to make at this age, right? So, so, so most of these professionals are no more reading at this distance. They've got a monitor on their office. So the reading distance, I find, is uh, fairly... So they don't need a 1.5 that way. A 0.75 or 1 is enough yes, for them. Yeah. Yes, yes. 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 To add something. Just very quickly on the eye dominance. I was asked by the Swedish biathlon committee Biathlon is when you ski and then you stop and you shoot. Yes. It's very exciting to watch actually. How to find out for these elite guys of eye dominance. And it was so easy. I gave them the gun, unloaded of course, and saw how they reacted. Yeah. And immediately I could see what the dominant eye was. So, but I think when it comes to the gun and looking through the eye, it will also depends on it will also depend on which is your hand, like basically because you would like to hold. Oh, oh, of, of, of course. Yes. I mean, if you are left-handed, yes, presumably, right, you have a left eye dominance, right? Yes. It's very seldom your cross dominance. Thank you, and I think we'll also ask uh, Dr. Anand about... I, I would probably yeah. aim... Uh, my concept is slightly different. I find that I would prefer to undercorrect 0.5 in both eyes and I find at least in I've done um, somewhere from 37 up to even 47 50s and I find just to keep them slightly myopic but equal in both eyes, both eyes. tends to works better okay. rather so you, than you think that there is a bit yeah, of summation there like probably I think okay. you, whatever I mean you induce a spit of spherical aberration with LASIK anyway and you give them an extended depth of forces so something around 0.5 to 0.75 in both eyes and they're usually comfortable with intermediate Okay, I've not but, had an but issue. they are not complaining about the distance. Distance, no. no. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you, it's a trade-off. I tell okay. them if you're highway driving, I do give them a 0.5 glass. But okay. they're actually fairly independent of glasses. That's my preference. That's, that's a different view. Thank you very much. What is your view, Adman? So, no, I think uh, probably I've, what I would like to discuss is I uh, tend to discuss with the patient about this. So I tell them that uh, are you okay to use reading glasses when you get them? And if they say that I don't mind using reading glasses like my friends, then I will correct them for distance. And if they say that, Ki, uh, but if I can also do something for the near from now, then I'll go with uh, a micro monovision where I will be probably under correcting by about minus one in the other eye. That is what I will be doing. Thank you. So I think now we go to the next one after the patient evaluation is done. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Anand Parsharthi, a very good friend and a very prolific and uh, excellent cornea refractive surgeon. He practices in Chennai, has been a past 
a fellow from uh, LVP as well as from Singapore National Institute. Uh, he does a lot of presbyopic procedures, does a lot of innovative work with uh, refractive surgery and what he's going to talk to us about uh, is going to be the corneal approach of presbyopia, mainly the monovision and the blended vision approaches. Okay. Thank you, uh, Vardhaman, for inviting me. It's been nice. Uh, it's been almost, I think, about five, four years since we've been doing this course and I think uh, it's great that it's got uh, still got accepted every year and I'm, I congratulate you for that. Um, I've been asked to speak about a couple of topics about uh, laser correction of presbyopia and I'll be covering a bit on uh, Praveen's topic of monovision but a lot of it has already been covered so if that is an overlap I'll skip through it. Uh, I will probably, no financial interest uh, but it would be nice to have some. Uh, I guess I'll start with this random gentleman uh, whose photograph I got off the net. Uh, has some difficulty in reading uh, and printing in dim light for, and he's aged uh, by about 45 years. His intermediate vision is also affected and is dependent on glasses and he wanted to consider whether multifocal contact lens would be an option. Now he's fairly uh, active, he does some diving, he does some biking, uh, but he's finding it difficult to do his regular work uh, and he's also finding it difficult to uh, do surgery because he's also an eye surgeon. Sorry. Uh, so in terms of getting, I'll come back to that patient uh, later, but in terms of laser ablative strategies, there are broadly three or four multiple options. Uh, monovision, in which the dominant eye is corrected for distance, which we've discussed, and a cross monovision, which is the dominant eye is for near and the non-dominant is for far, because we know that dominance can switch. And there are multiple uh, multifocal ablations, uh, which and also a concept which did come into vogue earlier was intracorneal multifocality and inlays and hybrid techniques. I'm sure uh, Vardhaman will touch upon. Now, remember, for a full range of vision and uh, increased depth of focus of up, up up to three diopters would be ideal. That's what most of us usually require, which is for far, distance, intermediate, and computer. And this range usually uh, goes up as you. Uh, become older. Uh, but probably most of us can manage, especially beyond 40, with about 1.5, definitely up to about 50 to 55. And uh, there is definitely some loss of visual equity in near when you're uh, doing that. Uh, that is also well known, and this is now adopted by the IOL manufacturers, where you increase the depth of field by using the concept of aberrations. And if you see the uh, two pictures, below and above, uh, this is basically a perfectly arch, ideal sharp focus and with spherical aberrations both the distance and the near that is a bit of sharpness which basically gives you an irregular circle of uh, confusion uh, and you have a slight drop not a gr great amount in terms of contrast. So basically combining the increased depth of field and monovision with good visual equity is achieved basically for all distances and this is a concept which is basically pioneered by Zeiss, no financial interest, but uh, they have something called a blend zone where there is, uh, uh, where there is both the dominant and dominant eye have binocular vision, which is probably what a lot of uh, people, especially emetropic and uh, hyperopic biops tend to use a lot. Uh, now traditional monovision is slightly different, where you do have uh, basically dr a loss of distance and some loss of near as well and that is an area where things are not that clear and uh, in this concept basically they use a different kind of ablation the non-dominant eye actually would refract to something like a minus 1.5 uh, and the surgical presbyopic correction uh, is a concept that has been around now for at least since the fellowship which was almost about 18 uh, years back and I guess if it's not been confirmed it is never that perfect it is I would suggest more of an evolving uh, art. Uh, in terms of concept, the option is always to increase the depth of focus in both eyes, especially binocular because we do not use one eye at, at uh, any one time. We always use up both the eyes. For many presbyopes, this can be basically achieved by increasing uh, the uh, high order aberrations, which, is, which doesn't give you a lot of refraction, maybe about max about half a diopter. Uh, and in the highest levels of acuity and modular transfer function which is basically an optical bench test. Uh, remember that these are not usually prioritized in this kind of a procedure. Uh, 
Uh, multifocal ablations, uh, as I mentioned, was around for almost about 17 to 18 years, where they aimed for a semilunar shaped zone immediately around the pupillary center, uh, whereby you basically stapen the central corneal curvature, uh, and they, they report promising results. Remember, uh, I come from a generation where did, we did use uh, broad beam lasers. So at that time, there was something called central islands, which was considered a bad effect. Now, with the flying spot, you're actually trying to create the central island. So that's basically what uh, this does. It do gives you an additional uh, aspheric ablation or mid peripheral ablation with the flying laser, flying spot laser, which steepens the central part. And this is done in the non-dominant eye. So how you have, how what you end up with is something called a pseudo accommodative cornea, where you have a mid, a peripheral near zone. Uh, a central near zone and this is modified with uh, depending on the amount of correction that you do uh, and you add this uh, with the presbyopic correction usually about a diopter plus. Uh, remember that uh, there is some uh, there was one paper which found evidence for delayed presbyopia caused by induced corneal aberrations especially after PRK uh, and this they felt was basically because of the induced aberrations remember both LASIK and PRK uh, it would induce some kind of spherical aberrations. Uh, Presby LASIK is probably another important addition to the techniques of multifocal ablations uh, and a traditional uh, LASIK which we are all used to uh, to create a multifocal surface on the bed and this reduces the spectacle dependency in presbyopic patients. So you have multiple powers of uh, the uh, multiple powers of correction across the cornea. Uh, there is also a combination of micro monovision which we touched upon where you're aiming for about maybe about one diopter uh, and this there is then a difference of a focus shift between the eyes and the distance closer to ametro distance eye is closer to ametropia and the near eye is definitely more myopic. This does give a higher stereo equity and occasionally I do try and do maybe about 0.5 or 0.75 in both the eyes. This also I find tends to give a better balance in some patients who are not able to accept monovision. Uh, there are some good published results on presby uh, and which showed statistically significant differences both for myopic and uh, hyperopic cases when they used a bi-aspheric ablation profile. Uh, I will just touch upon something called intracorneal multifocality where uh, you have concentric ring, rings used to produce a weaker region in the central part of the cornea resulting in a hyperprolate shape. That means you try and make it something like more conical in the central part. This flapless procedure is restricted within the boundaries of the corneal stroma. There have been something called hybrid techniques where you use a combination of LASIK and something called supracore uh, and intracore which uh, causes reduced multifocality in distance in the distance eye combined with a full multifocality and mo monovision in the near eye. Uh, about maybe about eight to nine years back there was a lot of talk about intracore where you use femtosecond lasers to make intrastromal um, cylinders which cause steepening of the central part though over a period of time they did find that the cornea is elastic and the effect comes off. Camera I'm sure uh, Vardaman will touch about and laser blended vision where you have moderate multifocality in both the eyes combined with monovision in the near eye. So basically what Press Beyond, uh, what Zeiss does is to have a customized procedure, all distances and almost an immediate effect. A uh, fairly busy slide but just to touch upon that uh, what things that are applied to the patient's eye. In micro monovision you have, I guess this would be my take home uh, slide in terms of what you want to do. Uh, in a micro monovision the dominant eye is planar for distance and the non-dominant eye is myopic for near vision. The depth of field basically to reduce the anisometropia, you have binocular vision without adaptation time, which basically for a patient's point of view is very important. And the depth of field compensates for the lack of accommodation. So you, this is the uh, important part. Uh, you also need to control the spherical aberration and a spherical aberration within a certain limit to increase the depth of focus without compromising the perceived image quality. Uh, there is also something happening in terms of, uh, in terms of the patient's uh, uh, cortex where you have retinal image processing. There is a bit of neural summation, blur adaptation and over a period of time, usually about a month, there is some neural uh, suppression. Uh, when you do micro monovision, the concept is very similar. You do have uh, these things as well, but uh, in, in the amount of correction you could probably get with micro monovision is less. Uh, there, the only important part in terms of Zai, how it different, differs from the other points is basically using a larger optical zone uh, and also tends to uh, probably have some kind of a nomogram for functional age. Uh, this is how it is entered uh, in terms of the screen where you have 
the importance of wavefront measurements you have manifest and of course the intended correction what you want to do. So uh, these are important parts about uh, the nomogram that is built into the machine. Uh, and what they found, and remember that for almost all LASIK patients, the myopic press biops always tend to do better. So you have very good distance and uh, very good near vision. Uh, when you look at hyperopic press biops, the corrections are still good, but remember that they do tend to lose a bit of reading vision. You can never actually uh, correct them full. Uh, and for emetropic press biops, which are basically good for distance, you would uh, have good distance vision, a bit of drop of distance, but the reading, they tend to be fairly satisfied. Now, uh, this is basically important to say that there is no loss of contrast sensitivity in these patients and there is no loss of stereoacuity. So what did we do for this patient? Uh, broadly, uh, uh, the, the questions for any patient who would undergo LASIK is would it reduce my quality of vision? Does stereopsis get affected? Will it, will it interfere with surgical work? And what would I do if I do not get an optical uh, result? And what type of procedure and who would do my surgery? That's important. So in terms of uh, the patient, uh, there is good patient satisfaction. Uh, they almost 80% to 90% would actually recommend it to the, their friends and relatives. It does give good functional vision. Uh, the safety and track record uh, of femtolasic is fairly well known in terms of safety. The follow-up data and satisfaction of patients who have actually undergone presbyon and it is, can be enhanced and that's an important part. Just like a LASIK, you can enhance this and bring both the eyes to the same level. Uh, and there are no permanent visual effects uh, and any side effects are basically corrected by glasses. Uh, and important to remember that uh, this is probably as much uh, correlates to the natural condition of the eye uh, in terms of contrast sensitivity stereopsis. Uh, you can adjust the microscope, of course, if you're an operating person, you can make one eye slightly more myopic. Uh, this is the pre-op scans of uh, that of uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh, where you had pre and post uh, fairly well centered, good thickness, uh, and uh, this is the topography. If you compare this uh, with the post-op, you can find that uh, there is a bi basically a bump uh, in the left eye, which is his uh, near dominant eye, and the distant dominant eye fairly. Uh, well centered ablation. This is pre-op, uh, this is the post-op atlas, you can make out right fairly good. The left eye you have a central bump which basically gives you about a diopter plus of uh, reading vision. Uh, in terms of side effects, maybe mild dry eyes, halos at night which you need to definitely wear glasses and that's something you could probably not get away from uh, and the glasses are only required for uh, highway driving. So in terms of uh, the first part of the talk I'm done, uh, I want, he wanted me to touch also about monovision. A lot of has already been covered. Uh, Vardhaman, do you want me to still continue yes. or? Yeah, okay. Uh, in terms of monovision, I think uh, the non-dominant eyes are corrected for near while the dominant eyes set for distance. Uh, and monovision as a concept can be achieved both by contact lenses, conductive keratoplasty, refractive laser procedure, inlays and intracolor lenses. Uh, remember that uh, patients with monovision through laser vision correction have better tolerance of monovision than contact wearers. So that is the difference because there is some neural adaptation that takes place. This is be basically because of binocular adaptation, uh, less residual anisoconia and, and a decreased contact lens discomfort and maintenance. Uh, the success rate of monovision lasers is roughly about 70 to 92 uh, percent and you need to have good, uh, uh, this is basically related to good intraocular blur suppression uh, and uh, treatment of the anisometropia. Uh, successful distal correction of the dominant eye, important especially if you need to do a cyclorefraction and that's something I would recommend definitely for hyperopes. Uh, good stereo equity, loss of esoph esophoric shift and the willingness uh, and motivation is important for this patient. Uh, the degree of ocular dominance plays an important role uh, in monovision correction and patients with strong sighting preference tend to have reduced intraocular blur suppression uh, which can basically give them symptoms uh, but usually the neural adaptation would take about six uh, to eight weeks. Uh, with, and these all patients also have decreased depth of focus that makes monovision less tolerable. Uh, is there a difference between myopic or hyperopic monovision? Uh, hyperopic uh, patients t undergo monovision treatment do better than myopic patients in terms of refractive success and the acceptance of monovision because remember that a lot of the hyperopic patients see blur for distance and for near. So if you can make one part clearer, they tend to be a lot more happier. There are of course some disadvantages. There is a blur or a fog, glare and hano, especially at night. You can have reduced nighttime vision, depth perception and contrast. Uh, and occasionally you can have 
transient diplopia because of temporary strabismus. Important that you do muscle balance and uh, in, in all these patients because occasionally there have been reports of the squint being ma becoming manifest after surgery, especially in hyperopes. Contact lens trials is a good guide. It's probably the most accurate way of uh, simulation uh, of monovision. Uh, and this is important that you do if you're planning it. Uh, because of uh, the minimal induced anisoconia and no prismatic effect, this simulation mimics monovision at the corneal plane and can be a good predictor for final patient satisfaction. I'd end with that. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anand. I think, uh, Professor, uh, Professor wants to ask you a question. Uh, just uh, a few comments. Um, corneal inlays have great difficulties. And I believe one of the companies is closed down already. Remission, Raindrop. Raindrop, and um, there are others to follow. So I think it's a dead procedure. Secondly, uh, you mentioned um, one of the procedures for presbylasic, not insufficient. Um, what? Intracor, thank you. Do not use that, please, if you think of it. I hope that it's withdrawn from the company. Well, I think that has uh, more or less been given up. Intracor was, and yeah. more, as I mentioned, it's yeah. because of the elasticity. And the final comment if you have a Caucasian patient, and contemplate doing um, monovision. Make sure that the patient knows what the rules are for night driving in that country because some of the countries in Europe do not allow monovision and night driving. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we did not know about the last point, uh, Professor. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, because when we are talking about monovision, I would like to actually ask uh, Dr. Anand, uh, that how much of monovision do you target? Are you actually doing a differential monovision for different age groups depending on the needs and other things? How do you decide on monovision? Like how much to do it? Okay, I think uh, two important points. One is the amount of uh, what is the pre-op refraction and what is the age? Uh, anybody beyond 45, uh, we do know that their accommodation would get weaker. So I tend to keep probably I would err on keeping somewhere between 1 to 1.5, uh, telling them that uh, I'm doing this so that in future you do not require glasses. I think uh, speaking to the patient and getting their questionnaire I think is probably the most important part. Uh, my mentor used to say the amount of time in LASIK you spend before speaking to the patient, if you spend more time speaking to the patient before surgery, you'll probably spend less time speaking after. So I think that's an important part. So uh, younger patients, I tend to do definitely tend to keep them within about 0 0.5, 0 0.75 in, in the uh, non-dominant eye. And what is the, uh, the maximum monovision that you have achieved until now? In terms of stereo equity, I've not actually measured, but in terms of uh, sphere corrections, the max I've done is about minus 1.25. That's my limit. Okay, so you have never done more than minus no. 1.25. What about... So uh, two uh, things, uh, yeah. sorry. Uh, yes, sir. First one, what is the g maximum age you have done uh, LASIK in a myo for monovision? And uh, what is the maximum uh, myopia the patient had? Means uh, moderate myops, minus 4, 5, and then minus 8, 10. And then so to I think the same. For me, the ballpark figure is that if anybody who is uh, beyond 55, I don't do corneal procedures for them. Even if they are, let's say, minus 3 myope. I will choose to do the lens-based procedure uh, for anyone who is between 45 uh, to 55 or 40 to 55. I will choose the corneal procedure uh, for myopias. Uh, when it comes to the hyperopia, uh, I tend to go more towards the lens-based procedures as compared to the myopic patients. Even if they have, let's say, plus 3 at 45, I will actually talk to them and I will probably prefer to do a lens-based procedure for them. What is the highest amount of myopia that I've done monovision with uh, if a patient had? I think uh, must be about close to minus seven uh, in both eyes, in which I uh, left behind, I think, uh, minus 1.5 to minus 1.75. Uh, maximum monovision that I that typically do is about minus 1.75. Uh, that is what I have attempted. Um, uh, as I have already discussed with Anand, he is not comfortable going beyond minus 1.25. Uh, what about you, Dr. Kapoor? Yeah. 
Normally, you know, 1.5 would be my limit to 1.5, approximately yeah, yeah, 1.5 will 5 be your limit. What about yeah. professor? Uh, the same, right? So about, I think the the take home message is about 1.5 diopters of micro monovision is not uh, what you should aim for. Uh, coming to the second question, because we are still on monovision, is how many percentage of people that you're putting a monofocal lens in, you actually plan for a monovision with the lens implant, with the cataract surgery? That's a yeah. very good question. It's probably, it's probably uh, relevant to a lot of us in terms of, uh, in I think in for me, the first eye then becomes the most important indicator. Uh, and I, I, I aim at least in terms of, see, most of our IOL formulas are actually very, very good. Uh, Again, in terms of patient requirements, if it's a homebound patient, I tend to still err on the type on side of myopia. Uh, but but about 0.5 is my limit for the first eye. Uh, and if I've hit emetropia in the first eye, I would then aim for 0.5 in the other eye. So for cataract patients, my limit is a lot lower. Only 0.5? Uh, only 0.5. Only 0.5. Okay. Wow. And what kind of lens will you choose for them? So do you think that um, uh, choosing a spherical as well as a spherical lens makes a difference here? Yeah? Unless your uh, IOL uh, calculation is so spot on where you could actually play around with a spherical aberration, my personal experience, I don't think it makes a big difference in non What kind of lens I think the material is probably more important for me. All right, sure. Thank you. So I think uh, from there we'll go to the, the last talk of uh, this session. Uh, which is on corneal inlays. So I'm going to just touch upon what has been the, the recent advancements and resurgence of corneal inlays, why it has happened, and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Dr. Vadman doesn't need any introduction, but even if I read from his slide here, he's had an excellent undergraduate and postgraduate career. He was at KEM in Bombay comes from a family of refractive surgeons. His father has been one of the oldest refractive surgeons in our part of the country. And then Vardaman had an excellent stint with, uh, at Greece with Dr. Palikaris, who invented the whole LASIK business. And he came back with a lot of publications, which I think half of them he's still waiting to publish somewhere. And so great to be, have you here, Vardaman. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, so I think taking from what we have discussed about the corneal procedures, this is the, the last corneal procedure that I'm going to talk to you about. And it is a bit controversial as we have also gathered from what uh, Professor said. Uh, however, there are certain things or certain patients in which this uh, procedure still plays a very good role. And I'm going to just touch upon that. Uh, I don't have any financial interest. As we all understand, as the baby boomer generation is aging, there is an increase in demand for presbyopia correction. The baby boomer generation was the generation which was exposed to the benefits of LASIK for the first time in the world. So they were the people who saw that the glasses can be removed with a valve effect with LASIK around the world and especially in the US. So that, become like, that became like a global big phenomenon. And this is, these are the typical people who, were, who have undergone LASIK in their, in let's say, 1990s. They are now becoming presbyopic, as we know, and they have already had the benefits of being a spectacle-free life. And that is what they would demand even now, and even at the time of they undergo cataract surgery, as we understand. So the refractive surgeons of today, as we understand, there are so many procedures that even Dr. Anand has described. They are rapidly adapting to various methods. Presby uh, they are proposed for presbyopia reversal, and continuous research and innovation is happening. It is translating into development of this many, many techniques. So this is a very busy slide of showing the armamentariums of the presbyopia procedures there. So when you have to understand that when you have a, uh, when you have so many options for a single entity of treatment, that just means that probably none of these options works the best. In the sense that you have to really customize according to, to the patient what kind of approach you are going to choose for this particular patient and, and, and choose from the corneal and the lens-based procedures mainly. The scleral approach has not been extremely successful. Is not, uh, that's why we are not discussing it here. What we follow is uh, my mentor, Professor Ionis Palikaris' presbyopia surgery algorithm, which uh, it depends on the age and the pre-existing refractive error of the patient, as we know. So if a patient is younger, let's say about 40 to f uh, 45 years of age and has uh, and so in that case, definitely I will use uh, the corneal laser procedures, such as either the monovision or currently the blended vision techniques. 
uh, I'm not very big fan of multifocal lasers such as uh, prismatic LASIK as well as IntraCore or CK as we have discussed already. Till the age of 55, I will still be happy doing corneal lasers. If the patient has ametropia, that means if the patient has refractive error, either myopia or hyperopia. So till that time, I will definitely choose still to do the, uh, the laser procedures on the cornea. And if the patient is more than 55 years of age, even though he has a clear lens, I will not choose the corneal procedures. I will definitely go for clear lens extraction along with implantation of multifocal lenses or extended depth of focus lenses that are available today, which are excellent. So why so? Because in many of these patients, you also have lenticular aberrations which are developing. So although you see the lens is clear, but the lenticular aberrations are developing and they are going to go, uh, to go on increasing as the time goes by. And of course, the patient is going to develop cataract. By that time, he will lose all the benefits that he achieved with his corneal laser procedure. So the most important thing that we have to focus here is what about this age group, which is 45 to 55, and the patients who don't have any refractive errors. So as we know, uh, the million dollar question is how to manage a plano presbyopic patient between the 45 to 55 age group who is probably too old for corneal lasers and they're probably too young for the clear lens extraction. So for this uh, age group and for plano patients, we need a method for this target group which will be minimal invasive and reversible. So here is a potential role for what is called as intracorneal implants or corneal inlays. So corneal inlays are intracorneal lenses. They're implanted in the midstrom of the non-dominant eye. They improve the uncorrected vision for near, uh, near distance by modified monovision approach. So all these approaches, even with the inlays, also involve a bit of modification of monovision itself. There are a variety of mono, uh, corneal inlays which are available today. They include FlexiView, AccuFocus, and the Revision. Uh, and basically, they all work on different principles. Uh, the AccuFocus, which you can see in the center here, it works on the principle of uh, basically aperture. So that means you have a small aperture and with diffraction, there is a better depth of field that you achieve with this. What happens with the rend drop or the revision uh, lenses is that you actually cut a flap of the cornea, you cut a thin flap and you put the implant in the center. So what happens is that with that, there is a bit of bump which is created and because of that, the patient becomes a bit myopic. So there is a bit of my, uh, monovision which is achieved in one of the eyes with the revision with this technique and what we have most experience with is called as the flexiview lens which is the acrylic uh, hydrophilic lens as you can see it is a transparent lens you can't really see or make out on the slit lamp very easily and I'm going to discuss our results of more of that. The flexiview lens works on the principle of uh, uh, works on the optical principle so basically as you see you have a donut shaped uh, lens this donor shape lens has the central area which is without any refractive power which is going to focus for the distance mainly and it has the peripheral area which has the addition depending on the age of the patient. So if you actually take the full, con, uh, full eye wavefront analysis on eye tracy, you will see that in the center it is green because it is immetropic and in the periphery it becomes myopic. So that's how it works. So uh, the beauty of this uh, particular implant is that it works on the size of the pupil. So it is a smart monovision depending on the size of the pupil. As you know that when we are actually looking for near, our pupil is about 3.5 millimeters. It becomes slightly smaller. So when it is actually slightly smaller, what happens is that the rays of the light which are coming from close distance, they diverge and they hit the periphery of this implant so that there is this peripheral zone which works more and that is why you achieve this kind of monovision approach. And when it is far, then actually your pupil is going to expand and when the pupil expands, then the rays are mainly going from the center and from the periphery because now you have rays which are coming more on parallel direction. When these inlays were started, they were implanted in those times under the flap. As you can see, this is the flap of, uh, uh, done with a femtosecond laser. And after the flap is lifted, you, this is the AccuFocus. Uh, so our group had some initial experience with the AccuFocus and then we discontinued using this particular one. Uh, as you can see, this has to be centered very well and it is centered when you are taking the patient under the uh, eczema laser. So we have to ask the patient to look at the fixation light of the eczema laser and then center the implant. But what was seen in those times is that under the flap, it was not very stable. So what was designed was a pocket so as you can see, this is a pocket which is created and this pocket basically is a lamellar cut only and this lamellar cut gives us a small side cut on the external side to give us the access to the lamellar cut 
And here we are going again with this AccuFocus uh, inlay, which is also known as the camera inlay. And once it is implanted inside, it has to be again centered very well. But instead of cutting the flap, now at a, about depth of about 250 to 280 microns, then this uh, inlay was this inlay was planned. So what is done with uh, this FlexiView lens is now we use what is called as a eye pocket software. This eye pocket software was uh, uh, developed with Intralace. Uh, and in a combination or in conjunction with Unicity of Crete. So you can see this is the pocket which is created with the uh, intralase and this is the pocket which was created with the mechanical microkeratom. So basically, as you know, with the femtosecond laser, the pocket which is created is very uh, predictable. It is done extremely well. And this is the implantation system. As you can see, the patient is uh, now asked to look at the green fixation light and uh, the implant is disengaged. This is a very, very thin implant. Uh, the thickness of this implant runs into almost 50 microns. So as you can see, with a very gentle jet of fluid, you have to center it and ask the patient to, you can see this green fixation light here. So you have to ask patient to look at the green fixation light so that you can center the inlay very well. The centration of the inlay is actually the most important thing because it has to be on the line of sight. As you can see on the first day, uh, this inlay cannot be seen very easily. So this is the inlay which is seen on the slit lamp. It is almost invisible. So we uh, published our initial results of 31 plano presbyopic patients uh, who underwent this inlay in the non-dominant eye at the minimum in at the mean depth of pocket of 285 microns. And um, when we look at the non-dominant eye in which the inlay was implanted, the efficacy of improvement of the neovision without the glasses improved as the time went by. And about three months, about 75% plus patients had a near uh, visual acuity uh, on the modified ETDRS chart for near of about 20, 25 or better. And 100% of them had the near visual acuity of 20, 40 and better. As compared to that, the distance visual acuity in these patients as compared to only the non-dominant eye in which it was operated had decreased from 2020 to 2040. However, as we understand from this, the distance visual acuity, uh, what is lost in this modified monovision approach is much lesser as compared to the traditional monovision approach. For the similar kind of myopia achievement with traditional monovision, it should be about 20, 70 or less. So in this case, we are probably compromising less on the distance vision. But what is more important is that when we look at the, the real life situation in which we are actually seeing from both the eyes, so at the real life situations, you have a 20, 20 uncorrected vision for distance. Uh, binocularly. So you're not really losing on any uh, spectra distance uh, vision uh, when you're actually in real life situation. None of the eyes lost more, more than one line of best corrected visual acuity for near as well as for far, which speaks about the safety. And we also did confocal analysis, as you can see. So the integrity of the corneal health was really maintained very nicely. This is the inlay, which is seen in the mid stroma. And the, the hyper reflective dots that you see are a bit of um, debris, which is seen around it. So if we see all the three kind of inlays uh, are in, um, they work on the modified monovision approach. The FlexiView is the one that we are more experienced with. It achieves a very good uh, outcome. And the most important thing is that it is completely reversible. So for example, if somebody doesn't like the results or has a lot of optical phenomenons which are ha happening with the inlays, you can go in and you can remove it anytime. So to conclude, the early studies show that the corneal inlays have shown uh, a good resurgence. So there was a time in 1930s or 40s when the inlays were actually uh, innovated and they were tried, but they were stopped because they were playing with the nutrition of the cornea and was uh, causing a lot of untoward effects on the cornea. So they were stopped and then this is a new resurgence which happened. So with this, uh, you can see that there is a decently good uh, uh, visual gain. And most important thing is that this is fortunately a minimally invasive and reversible procedure. So it also maintains the corneal structural health uh, very well when looked at corneal confocal microscopy. And of course, as you know, this is new technology. It merits further long-term studies as well. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vardhavan. If you'll, uh, so to continue your discussion. Sure. Now your last slide said that uh, two camera and the other inlay are placed at 180 and FlexiView at 300. Right. So, what was the reason for this difference? So, yeah. So, ideal position to implant the inlay is about 280 to 300 microns. Uh, our group has chiefly used the FlexiView, and it was the pocket 
the let's say the idea of creating the pocket at 280 micron to 30 micron instead of cutting the flap was also from professor palikaris which was then applied with the intralace and uh, that's why mainly with our group it is about 280 microns most others were still using the flaps and they were slowly shifting to the pockets so basically when they were shifting to the pockets they did not go as deep but uh, what professor palikaris also says is that deeper you go is better in terms of maintaining the nutrition of the cornea so you are actually let's say uh, uh, maintaining the health of the cornea much better, the more so posterior. So those early necrosis that was seen and you know thinning of the flap and all, if you have maybe a very thin upper layer that is not, uh, maybe a deep upper layer is uh, better? Is maybe? better. So I think uh, all these inlays have been implanted for over six, seven years now. Okay. And none of them has actually shown uh, any problems of the corneal health per se. Yeah. In fact, um, because as we know these inlays have addition in the periphery, so we have to explant the inlay and implant another one every five years because the near vision requirement will change. But it is definitely easier than doing a, let's say, retreatment for a monovision to modify it because you don't have to cut open the flap and then do the laser and put the flap back. So in this approach, it is much, much easier than Just that. Just an update. Uh, wants to say something. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, because we I had uh, the same question for the guys. Now they are actually recommending below 280 to 70 Correct. for the camera as well. So they've yes. gone deeper. So uh, what... Uh, does this imply for say a simple thing like lacing if you're making pockets at 280 so are you weakening the cornea are you uh, not weakening do you uh, have the same protocol to screen for slight keratoconus 10 percent 20 percent and then reject all those patients and all that and uh, what is that so basically i think for whenever we want to touch the cornea we should always rule out the keratoconus but I think what happens in this particular cases is because we don't have the side cut. There is a new very nice study from Reinstein. What, is, what he has shown is that it is not the lamellar cut which is causing the imbalance in the biomechanics mainly, but it is the side cut. So if you just do the side cut for 200 microns and you do a side cut for 100 microns, the biomechanics of the cornea will be much different. Even though you don't cut the lamellar cut. In fact, he has published his studies by doing in vivo analysis on rabbit eyes about the same. So I think if we are screen the patients well and of course they don't have keratoconus and other things, uh, doing a pocket should not be an issue. Uh, there is one thing which always intrigues me, for example when we are talking about the depth. So in LASIK we are cutting the flap and then we are doing laser, we are putting the flap back and we say that because we are taking away the corneal tissue and the flap does not give the strength back to the cornea, that's why we have more chance of developing ectasia. What about the patients who undergo dulk? Because as we see in dulk, we are getting taking, I mean, we are getting rid of the whole cornea, just leaving behind the decimates and the endothelium. So the integral cornea, patients, its own integral cornea is only the decimates and the endothelium. And these patients don't develop ectasia. What is the reason? Very good question. This is the way people who don't know the answer will reply. Huh? It's a very no, good question. No, but that is what I'm but, saying. But so the uh, thing is, so. Uh, of course, Dalk, you're suturing. No, of you're suturing, but you're also taking away the suture. You can suture the flap as well if you, you want. You can suture the flap if Correct. you want. And even then, you've got a hinge and, you know, uh, yes. it's attached. Yes. So, I think this whole business of uh, depth, you know, is as intruding as it was 25 years back or yes. 30 years back. Yes. And the whole, if, if it was true that just going away from those 200 micron flaps which uh, dad and you know dr prakash kankari and we have come to 90 yeah. if that was the only thing we could do lasik on everybody you have no tension about you know keratoconus suspect this suspect because there's no ectasia so why can't the whole world undergo the procedure whoever wants it in fact so in fact i think the amount of ectasia that you hmm. must have seen 15, 20 years ago, hmm. and that you're seeing in today's patients, um. it is definitely more in today's patients, in spite of having all these <laughs> guidelines, in spite of having the thin flaps. And I heard that your, your topography shows that posterior surface also, and yes. all that, you go to that. Then you have so many technology. advanced scanning modalities also. So I think, I think as a pool, the, the corneal biomechanics is also changing by the generations maybe. I think that is also or the, let's say the, the lifestyle, eye rubbing, and all those factors are probably playing some role. Directly linked to your presentation. Yes. 
I think we owe the audience, since this is an instruction course, I was missing one sentence on your, one of your first slides on the options of correcting presbyopia. And that is a pharmaceutical correction, of course. Excuse me? Pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical, yes. 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 And today, there are two options for this. It's the Encore option by Novartis. Uh, that's a less lens softening. And then there is from two or three other companies. From uh, Lensar. My Myotic. Yeah. Um, giving an increased depth of focus. And I think we should just mention this to the audience here. I think and they, they're coming yeah. very close now. I think that is a very good point because uh, what Professor is trying to say in terms of the pharmaceutical, I think probably he will have more experience or Dr. Kapoor can uh, probably discuss more about it. But what uh, he is talking to us about the crystalline lens and uh, there is, as we all know, there is a laser called as Lensar and this is a femtosecond laser. It is called as Lensar because it is it was done for accommodation, uh, like let's say relaxation. So that's why it was called as Lensar. And in this case, what uh, Dr. Th uh, Kruger was trying to do was in the monkey model, he used this Lensar femtosecond lasers to create very uh, a pattern on the lens, which is going to increase, which is going to increase the um, the elasticity of the lens and probably try to bring it, reverse it back to the young age, something like that. And in the, there was uh, one, some initial success with that. He has also shown that there was no development of cataract. But I think there is a long way to go because I am hearing about this results for now almost six to seven years. And we are yet to actually understand what is happening uh, further in terms of development. I, I, I endorse uh, Professor's uh, thing on myotics. You myotics. Know, if you can put a camera inside, you simply put a drop of pilocarpine in the evening, you know, and, and I, I discussed this with the chief of uh, RP center, you know, glaucoma division, madam. And she has got thousands of patients. They are poor patients. They cannot afford the new glaucoma medicines. They are still on pilocarpine. And she says the ones after 40 are having brilliant unaided near vision. Correct. So there is an extraordinarily simple, cheap, effective way of increasing the depth of focus. Right. And uh, they, they, they have no of their own accommodation left. They are only depth of focus. So that ciliary spasm, headache, and all those excuses also don't work. Right. That the patients, they are patients above 40, you know. Absolutely. I think there are companies who are working on mixture of the drugs now, not only the pilocarpine. Oh, yes. Yes. There are about uh, two or three companies working with pilo in microdosage. And um, I heard just now that might be another company working on um, cabachol. Um, also, just very, very quickly, I think we will see a revolution very, very shortly when it comes to multifocals or bifocals or trifocals. I think we will move away from that. We are going for extended depth of vision IOLs. Simple IOLs, cheap, same price as a monofocal and ready to go. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. I think with this, uh, and we will take one comment from uh, Dr. Prakash Kankariya. One second. Sir. Anand? Anand, can you wait for one minute only? Yeah, three. Uh, that reminds me, like, uh, before LASIK, I was doing ALK or RMLK. And uh, we still follow those patients. That time we, we, we used to take off the corneal lenticule with the keratome. And uh, I'm surprised that uh, with LASIK we have induced uh, something like uh, progress in uh, myopia or something. But I am still surprised that that time the technology was so raw and we used to take the lenticule so deep. But th still they are doing so well. They are still steady and uh, they are doing extremely well. That is a surprise. 
Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing is under, you know, is still confusing <laughs> and yeah. Absolutely. And I think one thing probably I can add is some of the RK follow-ups that we see some, yeah. some of the times. I think it is because of a bit of multifocality that they have in the cornea, but they do have a better neovision uncorrectedly yeah. as compared to the patients who probably have not undergone. So, so I think we'll take one question from the audience. Yes. Can you... Excuse me, can you uh, take care of the mic there, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I had a yes. question regarding the FCAT uh, module on the uh, Wavelight platform. Right. right. Uh, we can change the uh, Q sure. value and uh, do the press biopia correction. Uh, uh, can you uh, guide us regarding, suppose the patient is having a pre-op Q value of plus, say plus 0.2 or a pre-op Q, Q value of around minus 0.2, then how, how do you decide how much you want to change and uh, what are the results? Any, any c control trials that are done and uh, patient satisfaction and you know, things like that. Right. So, uh, I think uh, we had uh, this platform of FCAT uh, available with us also, but more uh, experience I had when I was in Crete with Professor Palikaris also, because that time we were actually comparing the Supracore versus the FCAT module versus the Monovision and the other, other modules such as the Blended Vision also. Uh, but having said that, uh, of all the patients, uh, if we come to the Wavelight platform, I think the satisfaction was probably moderate, that is what I will say. And uh, even Professor Palikaris was not too fond of this FCAT module of the Q-value uh, customization per se. Uh, I think uh, uh, in terms of the predictability of even though you want to change the Q-value, for example now in Canada Conus also we want to change the Q-value, but it is inducing probably a lot of, uh, it is almost similar to the blended vision because you are also inducing spherical aberrations when you are changing the Q value per se, but it is I think not as controlled as in laser blended vision today. Probably it was more aggressive as compared to the laser blended vision. I think laser blended vision is probably more refined uh, way of doing the same. You mean to say that the effect that you got was not uh, all that much or patient had problems or for distance Patients vision. had lost best corrected visual acuity. Spectacle corrected best visual acuity. So, for example, if we are or treating these patients, some contrast sensitivity issues, like uh, they have those as well. But I think they had also the main reason why Professor Palikar has actually stopped doing this treatment that time because uh, the patients had started to uh, lose their spectacle corrected visual acuity. For example, if they were six six before, and in spite of using the glasses afterwards, even if you want to give them, they were not improving beyond six six partial or six nine also sometime. So they were not as happy as probably they would be. Like for example, if we just do a monovision, but the patients will not be actually losing the spectacle uh, best corrected visual acuity. They will all be correctable to the 6x. And that is what so was how, probably how it happening. How differs from the Zeiss platform? You are basically doing the same thing on the Zeiss platform also. Yes, you are doing the same thing. That's what I told. But I think in the Alcon platform, it is more aggressive when you are, it is not as refined as in the Zeiss platform. So, uh, if I have to tell you, uh, uh, we don't have a comparable study between the two, uh, Zeiss versus the Alcon. If somebody has that, then probably they can share the same with us as well. But I think compared to all the platforms which are currently available, I think uh, the one which, are, which we were most comfortable with was a plain monovision, number one, and number two was, to a certain extent, the laser blended vision. Including the Supracore as well as the Q uh, customization with the Wavelight and everything else, we saw that the patients were losing a bit of uh, best corrected visual acuity also. It is probably the pattern of ablation as well, I think the way that it is taking care of. You know anything more about it, uh, Dr. Kapoor? I have no experience with the Wavelight uh, mm -hmm. platforms at all. I've got so I think uh, with that, we'll come to uh, this uh, end of this course. I would like to thank all the co-instructors, uh, Professor uh, Kostenbaum. Uh, we would like to thank Dr. Kapoor, uh, Dr. Anand uh, for sparing their time. Thank you very much. I think we can have a small group photograph. We have some time left with us also. Thank you.